can go ahead and start our recording. Great. Pre-health shadowing is a virtual platform for students to connect with like-minded students and uh, established professionals in various fields. We are working to fight inequity in health education and promote diversity in the various fields by providing flexible and accessible learning opportunities for students everywhere. Our sessions are 100% free and always recorded to be made available at a later time for students who are unable to join um, due to any reason. As we are living in a global pandemic, it is crucial to be mindful about everybody's situations. All right, since pre-health shadowing is a flexible, accessible program, we are open to anyone who is interested, no matter where they are in the world. Go ahead and drop in the chat where you guys are Zooming from today. Welcome everybody, awesome. Alrighty, just a few housekeeping things before we begin. Uh, we do send out weekly emails with all of the upcoming speakers as well as quick links to register for the session. If you are not receiving these emails and you would like to, this is how to fix that. You're gonna go to our website, prehealthshadowing.com slash join us and sign up and put your email in the fields. Once you do so, you will be sent an email um, at some point and you're gonna go ahead and mark pre-health shadowing as important. Another thing you can do is to save pre-health shadowing as a contact, and this will tell your email that you want um, to receive all of these to your inbox and bypass the spam folder, the junk folder, and the promotions folder. So if you guys are interested in receiving exclusive opportunities and information, um, be sure to sign up for our email list. Just an update for you all, we now have closed captioning for all of our live sessions to accommodate students with hearing disabilities. Um, as we are working to create a flexible and accessible environment, we are um, hoping to show students of any ability that they are able to uh, reach their professional goals. We are currently having a fundraiser. If you guys would like to get involved, this is not only a fundraiser, but an initiative to um, provide for people who are currently less fortunate. And so um, as we are in a global crisis, um, not everyone has the proper materials to keep themselves safe. Um, and so we are uh, partnering with Mask for Mask, and essentially this program uh, donates every four masks that are purchased, um, they will donate four masks to um, someone in need. This could be um, hospitals, this could be homeless people or other um, people who do not have um, the resources to uh, get their own masks. So over 40,000 masks have been donated in the last four months. We're hoping that you guys can help us. If you're looking to get involved and make a change in your community, now is your chance. Please visit the website www.mask- for the number four, mask.com. Be sure to use the code PHS15 for 15% 15 off of your purchase. And any purchases that you use this code, Pre-Health Shadowing, our student-led nonprofit organization, will receive 10% of the money. So we really appreciate your guys' support. We're hoping to send as many masks as we can out. Um, and we are also hoping to gain enough money to upgrade our platforms to support more students and get a larger reach. If you guys have any questions about this, feel free to email us at fundraising at prehealthshadowing.com. All right, for all of my students that are interested in getting published, we do have opportunities for you. Please listen up as this is not available on our website um, from the main menu. You must type this in specifically. So this is an exclusive opportunity only for our live session folks. Um, Prehealthshadowing.com slash blog hyphen submissions is where you're going to go to turn this in. Um, you can submit articles, reflections, reviews, and success stories. And so if you're unclear about any of this, feel free to email us at info at prehealthshadowing.com. Um, there is a rubric that we will uh, be posting on our website within the next two weeks. Um, if you do get approved and get an offer, you have the potential to be published on our official website. This is not only great, um, to get your name out there, but also uh, great for CVs, resumes, applications to show um, that you are not only insightful, but you have good writing skills as well, which is something that is very crucial as you work to go into various health fields. 
for everybody joining us in our live session today, I invite you to pull out your phone. Um, I do have a QR code here, and this will, upon scanning it, take you to the Pre-Health Shadowing website to our donate page. And so Pre-Health Shadowing, like I said, is a student-led nonprofit organization. We were created in response to the COVID-19 pandemic as we are all facing the same issues. Um, everybody on our team is a pre-health student like myself. Um, and so we are all facing the issue of not having enough experience to commit ourselves to a field in healthcare. Um, and so I really want to just put it out there that we are providing these opportunities for you. Please help us stay alive and fight inequity in um, regions of low income or low socioeconomic status. We are really working to diversify the healthcare field. Um, just a fun fact for you all, um, White people make up approximately 60% of the US population, however, make up 92.8% of the um, veterinarians in the US. Um, and so we are trying to not only um, change the statistic to represent the US population, but also to create the opportunities for students to get to their point. Um, please support us in doing this. If you are a high schooler and interested in getting involved in the pre-health shadowing team, we do have a new opportunity for you all. This is called HTP. Um, you can apply on our website with our regular team member application. Um, just indicate in the comments that you are interested in applying for the HTP program. This will allow you to connect with other like-minded high schoolers across the nation and establish various um, chapters of pre-health shadowing at um, different high schools. If you are looking for a mentor, we got you covered. Listen up, this is by invite only. So I will be going over how to receive an invitation. Um, we are having a mentorship networking weekend. This is a three day event. You will have the opportunity to meet with two established professionals per day of the event. So if you attend all three days, you have the potential of meeting with up to six professionals. Um, this can be in your specific field of interest or in various fields if you are exploring. Um, not only do you gain connections with like-minded students, but you also can connect with professionals and um, establish uh, various connections. To get invited, uh, all you have to do is submit this bingo board. Um, and so you can submit the filled up bingo board on our website, post it on your social media, um, have various donors um, support you. Uh, and once you get all of your boxes filled in some way, I know that there are some that are more like $16. If you have four people send you $4 each, that will go through the $16. So it doesn't have to be per square. Um, the total of the board is $136. If you are able to get 136 or more, you are more than welcome to submit it. Um, please be sure that you register as a volunteer on our website and download the materials from our Google Drive. We do have more information about this on our website. If you go to www.prehealthshadowing.com slash mentorship bingo one, that will give you all of the information you need. Um, our volunteer coordinator, Hannah Ng, just dropped the link in the chat. Be sure to open it up and keep it open if you are interested. If you have any questions about this, feel free to email Hannah at volunteers at prehealthshadowing.com. If you're interested in getting involved, we have very um, accessible opportunities for you all. You can work on your own time, on your own schedule, um, virtually. You can start your own projects. This is really a, a great opportunity. You can take this anywhere you want. Um, if you have a wonderful idea that you want to lead yourself and pursue with a group of students, um, this is your chance. So go ahead and apply on our website, prehealthshadowing.com slash volunteer. And if you have any questions, we will go more in depth into this at the end of the session today. If you are joining us in our live session today, be sure to post pre-health shadowing on your social media for an opportunity to get reposted on our official page. Be sure to tag at pre-health shadowing. Go ahead and show us your setup for today. Um, we are really interested to see um, all of our various students and how they are uh, benefiting from pre-health shadowing. So be sure to tag us. With pre-health shadowing, students are eligible to take a post-shadowing assessment to verify their virtual shadowing hours in today's session. So I encourage you all to take very good notes and to ask our professionals some insightful questions. You are able to drop your questions in the chat throughout the session and we will ask them during the Q&A portion. Um, if you guys 
are interested in asking your question directly to the professional, go ahead and send a um, direct message to uh, our president, Rose Ann Dino, uh, with your question. And then if she approves it, you can raise your hand and ask your question directly to the professional. All right, and without further ado, I would like to welcome to you our professional for today. Thank you so much for joining us. We're really excited to learn a little bit more about the admissions process. Um, so thank you. Welcome. Thanks for having me. Jeez, this is, I was, I had not heard of you guys before, and I just became more and more impressed as I learned more about your organization. And I'm just going to turn my presentation over to Nina and just have her do it, and I'll just listen, because I think I'll learn more from that way. <laughs> Free Health Shadowing is a terrific organization, and I'm I'm definitely going to steer my advisees in your direction. So, um, I'm you. very excited to be here. Thanks for asking me. I, I appreciate it. So, um, my name is Dr. David Kennecke. I am the Assistant Vice President for uh, Admissions at AT Still University. AT Still University is a is a graduate healthcare university. Uh, our flagship school is where I'm talking to you from today. That's Kirksville, Missouri. It's in Northeast Missouri. I'm a town about a little under 20,000 people. So it's a small town compared to where most of you are at. Um, we also have a campus in Mesa, Arizona. We have a dental campus in St. Louis, Missouri, and we are starting a campus right now. We're going to start a PA program in Santa Maria, California. So we are, uh, we're expanding and we have distance sites all over the country. So um, if you haven't heard of AT Still University, you, you may, as you get deeper and deeper into healthcare. So um, explain a little background first. AT Still University is the founding school of osteopathic medicine. So that's my forte. That's kind of what we're the experts at is osteopathic medicine. And if any of you are interested in, in that career path, you know, I'm, I'm more than happy to help you. Uh, my job takes me into other healthcare professions, though. I was an assistant dean for academic progress at the Arizona School of Dentistry and Oral Health in Arizona, and I'm on the admissions committee for the Missouri School of Dentistry and Oral Health, so I understand dental admissions as well. I also work with other allied healthcare professions. Uh, PA I've worked with, I've worked with occupational therapy, audiology, a little bit with athletic training, physical therapy. So I tried to make my presentation today as generic as possible to meet all of those needs. So I'm not an expert in all of them. I know more about some of them than others. And if I don't have an answer to your question that you have for me, I have people. I know a guy that, I'm a guy that knows a guy. So I can probably get an answer to your question. So without any, what I wanted to do is, um, Nina kind of gave me a choice on what to present with today. And <clears throat> she limited me on how long I could talk because. I love what I do and I can talk about it all day. So I know you don't wanna hear me do that. So I really thought about what people ask me the most when I'm out and um, talking to others. So um, I really, my presentation is more about how to be a competitive applicant because a lot of you are in those preliminary stages of, um, of school, you haven't filled out an application yet. If you have, you know, we can talk about the further stages as well. I'll, I'll kind of uh, hint on those, but we wanted to make sure we understand what it takes to be a competitive applicant in healthcare, in the healthcare um, academics or to get into a healthcare program. So without any further ado, I'm gonna share my screen here. And I'm not very good technologically, so there we go. How's that? Everybody see that? Okay, good, thanks. So um, again, we're gonna talk about competitive applications and how do I, there we go. All right. So <clears throat> this is going to be true for a number of different healthcare professions. Uh, let's, let's dissect the application itself. Let's look at the separate parts of that application. Most larger healthcare programs have what we call a primary application. So most of them will have a centralized application. For short, we call it a CAS, which stands for Centralized Application Service. So it's a website you go on. If you filled out an application, this is old news to you. Um, but you will go to a centralized spot to fill out one application, and that application will get designated to the schools that you require or that you ask it to designate. So you, you pay for one, uh, pay for a starter, 
Um, it can run anywhere from 250 to 300 and over dollars for that initial. And then sometimes they charge you per designation or per group of designations. And what I mean by designations, if you want your school to go to um, tech school or Harvard Medical School or whatever, you can designate your application to go to those. So the primary application is, is a long process. And we're gonna talk more about it as we, as we go along, but um, it's a large document. <clears throat> Don't sit down and think you're gonna do it in an hour or so. It doesn't, it doesn't work like that. It's a very detailed, very deep um, drilling uh, document. So you wanna be able to make sure that you've got time to fill this out accurately and thoughtfully because this is what's gonna get you into medical school or dental school or healthcare uh, in general, all right? Most schools will have what they call a secondary application. So the primary application is more generic. It's, it'll be uh, specific for medicine, specific for dentistry, PT, OT, whatever, whatever your chosen, chosen field. Most schools, once you fill out the primary application and you designate that to go to that school, the primary application will show up at the school. Uh, the school will then maybe have certain parameters that might be, you know, minimum GPA. And that's what ours is at AT still. We have minimum GPAs for our program. And if you don't meet that minimum GPA, this, the, the, the application will get kicked back to you. All right. Uh, so that's kind of the first barrier in, in the buying. But uh, so the secondary application, once you get the invitation to fill that out, is much more specific for the school that you're filling it out for, all right? So it's gonna ask narrative questions. Why do you wanna to go to our school? Um, you know, what makes you a good applicant? Things like that. I mean, the questions vary. Even within my own schools under my own ATSU umbrella, the secondary applications are all pretty different. But they all ask, you know, do, what are the recommended program? What are the recommended classes did you take? Uh, most of them are, why do you wanna to go to our school? And you know, what, what makes you a good applicant? Those are really the general, the general courses. So um, once you fill out the secondary application and complete that, that's where it starts getting reviewed. Most, most programs, most schools will have another charge for the secondary application. This is not an inexpensive process. I'm not gonna lie to you. It's not cheap to apply to medical, dental, PT schools, healthcare schools. So uh, for instance, our secondary application fee is $70. Um, just to give an example, some are a lot more, some are, some are less. So we're, we're a little lower than average, I think, as far as secondary apps go, just to give you an idea. Uh, but once that secondary application goes through, um, then the school will start to collect all your ancillary or all your outside um, resources. Like it says, letters of recommendation, test scores, experiences, things like that. We're gonna talk more about those in depth as we go along here as well, all right? So what, in, in most cases, I'm gonna say in most cases, what makes an application competitive? Um, <clears throat> nowadays, not when I went to school, but nowadays, I went to school a long time ago, uh, currently programs don't necessarily, some, some programs don't necessarily have to have a bachelor's degree to enter it. But most of the applicants that are going to that, that are applying to that school will have a bachelor's degree. We have a program that the bachelor's degree is not required, um, but I think in the last four years, we've, we've admitted one person without a bachelor's degree and their, their marks and their experiences were way above the average. So a bachelor's degree is a good way to start with a competitive application. A bachelor's degree is not required at the time you apply, um, but it is required most of the time by the time you would matriculate into that program. Here's one thing that I've, I've learned when I was advising students in my years is that they were looking at the minimum GPA requirement for most programs. Do not look at the minimum GPA requirement for most programs. Look at the average GPA. So go on the website and see what their, their demographics are. What is the average GPA for their incoming class last year or this year? Year to year, it's not gonna vary much, but you wanna look at that average GPA and be within that ballpark. If you do the minimum GPA, it's gonna make you a less competitive applicant. So 
We'll put up a poll question here. Is it possible to get into medical school, medical school with a low GPA? What do you guys think? So I'll give you some time. Do, do I want to give, give them some time to fill that out, Nina, or just keep going? Okay. Go. Oh, wow. God, you guys are fast. <laughs> so yes, it is possible to get into medical school with a low GPA. So I'll explain this in a little bit, but um, it depends on other parts of your application. So especially in osteopathic uh, medical schools and more so in medical and dental and other healthcare programs, they're doing what's called a holistic review of your application, all right? It used to be in the olden days, GPA and test scores, MCAT, DAT, GRE, whatever, were just, that's it. That's the only way you got in were those, me were those metrics. Well, they're finding out now because you all are so freaking smart and you do so well on your tests that we had to go, well, they're all the same. So what's gonna make them different? And what, and also how can we make sure they're a good fit for our school? So schools, you know, 10, 25 years ago, however long ago it was, started to look at other qualitative aspects of the application, which again, we'll talk more about as we go along. But, uh, but yeah, GPA is just one metric we use in assessing the application, as is the test scores that write down. So we're talking uh, that standardized test score. So we have people that have terrific GPAs, three eights, three sevens, three nines or whatever, but can't do well on a standardized test. Um, and we, uh, we understand that, you know, they'll have a great GPA, they'll have outstanding experiences, outstanding letters of recommendation, all of those qualitative items that we talked about will be outstanding, but they tried to take, say the MCAT, for example, a couple of times and they really haven't done very well. Well, that won't necessarily keep you out of medical school either. Um, it's only one part of the whole picture, all right? Prerequisites, do you have to have prerequisites done by the time you apply? Most schools you do not. But what I would recommend is that you have a good majority of them done by the time you fill out your application or submit your application. Only have like one or two left because you're by the time your application is reviewed, you're probably in the fall of your senior year. So you've got the, the rest of your fall and your spring year. Let's take a gap year and then it's different. Um, we'll talk about those two. But um, if you have, if you're in the fall of your senior year and you've got five or six prerequisites left, the chances are, you know, we don't get a good idea of what kind of student you are in the sciences, nor do, will we, are you sure that you're gonna complete those by the time you graduate? So have most of those prerequisites done by the time uh, you apply. Letters of recommendation, we're gonna get deep down, we're gonna drill deeper down into those. Um, but all I could say about letters of recommendation right now is develop a relationship, okay? We'll talk more about that. Clinical experience, clinical experience is very important. Um, number one reason, is because we want you to make sure you know what you're getting into. Whenever you enter a healthcare professional school and a healthcare profession, it's a lifelong commitment. We want you to understand that you're going to school now for a 30, 40 year career. So we wanna make sure that you have at least a, a, a slight idea of what you're getting into. So that clinical experience is gonna be essentially very, very important. Again, we'll talk more about this later in the, in the presentation as well. Professional exposure, that's more or less shadowing. Uh, it's the same thing as clinical experience. We want you to have, at least have an, a good idea of what you're getting into, all right? Community service is becoming much more popular since I've started in admissions. Um, community service really, especially for the healthcare professions, because being a healthcare uh, professional means you have to really like people. If you don't like people, you're in the wrong profession, right? So you have to like people, you have to like serving people, you have to love serving people. So community service is a way that you can not only test yourself on how you love to serve, but also show and demonstrate to the, uh, the school or the profession what kind of person you are. You have that service orientation, you have that service heart, we call it. So community services is pretty important in the overall qualitative aspect of your application. Leadership is also some, um, important. We wanna make sure that you 
uh, have some sort of leadership experience and that could be wide variety. That might be in a student organization, that might be in a job you had, it might be you were the eldest in your family and you were you know, taking care of some kids, uh, et cetera. I've seen multiple scenarios as far as what leadership constitutes. So, um, but we also wanna make sure that you can handle yourself, all right? Usually very interactive. So if I happen to say, do you have any questions? That's out of habit. I know we'll get to that later. <laughs> so <clears throat> in that primary application, you fill out demographics, you fill out who you are, where you're from, who your parents are, um, and you've got some questions on dis disciplinary history, things like that. But probably one of the most important parts of your application is this, it's called the personal statement. Um, for those of you that have filled in them out before, you know how important they are. For those of you who haven't, we're gonna iterate it right now, how important this personal statement is. The personal statement is a 4,500 character uh, component of the application where you get to tell your story, tell your story narratively. So it's like writing a 250 word essay on yourself. So it's not a lot of room, really. I know you guys are all young, but you still have a great story to tell. And so you have to be very good at what you're doing in that personal statement. This is what you want to spend most of your time on. The rest of the applications are question and answer. This is something you have to put some thought into. This is something you really want to have people proofread, and we'll talk about that later but this is where you get to tell your story. So really the personal statement, they wanna ask you, we're gonna jump down to the middle. They ask you two basic questions is, why do you wanna do what, you, what you're seeking? Why do you wanna do healthcare? And how would you be good at it? Or why would you be a good provider? So in that personal statement, you wanna say about motivation, you wanna talk about your motivation and you wanna say how you are going to enter that healthcare profession and be an asset and be a, uh, a good provider for the community. So you wanna provide examples of that. So give a, you know, a, little, a little story about yourself if you want to. A lot of people give specific examples of when they were working or shadowing or something of that nature. There are many obstacles that everybody has in life. This is a good time to explain those obstacles, um, whether it be academics, whether it be personal, uh, anything that you want to provide information for. The biggest question is, what do? how much do you provide in a personal statement as far as your personal life? And that's a great question. Uh, you want to provide as much as you can explain and as much as you um, can be accountable for, if that makes any sense. But when you do that, there we go. What is the biggest mistake seen in medical school applicants? Is it trying too hard to impress the interviewer? not telling the authentic story, GPA is too low, applying too late. Give you a couple minutes for that one. Thank you, I can take a drink of water now. <laughs> okay, not telling the authentic story, you guys are on it. On it for sure. Not telling their authentic story is, as a um, advisor and as an interviewer and as a member of admissions committee. When I interview somebody and they're trying to impress me and I can see it and they're not being authentic about it, um, it it just it's one of my pet peeves. I will score them low for that reason because they're not being honest. When you're not authentic, you're not honest. So that's you guys have, are really hitting it. Uh, right on the money with the poll question. Good job. So back to the personal statement, addressing red flags, uh, explaining obstacles, kind of the same thing, red flags in your, maybe it's a low GPA for one semester, or you know you failed out or academic probation. Uh, I've seen a lot of people get into med school with academic probations, by the way, if that helps. Uh, we talked about low GPA. Show your passion. That's again, your motivation. Show your motivation for why you wanna do this and be a bit inspiring. We're gonna have that in multiple multiple slides here. All right, there we go. Work experience. Remember we talked about the qualitative aspects of the application. So we're, uh, we're talking about things that we can't really put a correct, put a good number on. Work experience is definitely one of those. Uh, a lot of people now, now more and more, you guys have to work while you're going through to school. So really, you know, in all honesty, between you and me, you guys have to do 
work miracles to me when I read these, some of these applications. I don't know how you do it. Um, you impress me every day when I read applications and meet you guys for an interview because a lot of you work, a lot of you do volunteer work, a lot of you are involved in student organizations and you're rock stars when it, when it comes to your academics. So um, this, is, this is not, you know, that's not the top tier class. That's an average, you know, that's a lot of people that we, that apply to schools and a lot of people that interview. So good job and keep that up. And this, this organization is gonna help you keep doing that. Anyway, um, work experience. Working is good, obviously. It's going to be an aspect that is outside of academics or outside of your classroom. Uh, it may be even working in the union, but that's still something outside of your normal, what you're, what you're doing day to day. So that was why I say work anywhere. It doesn't matter what your job is. You can, you can flip burgers or you can be a hospital transport person, patient care tech, whatever it might be. Uh, and those are all going to help that overall qualitative picture as long as you're successful. Um, speaking of successful, when you work, you want to be consistent in your job. I've seen people that have worked you know, one job every two months. Um, don't, don't do that. If you have a job, try to work on hard on keeping it. That's going to reflect well on your application when it sees that you are consistent in your job, maybe even promoted in your job. Those will all look very, very good. Explain duties briefly. That way the, the reviewer gets an idea of what you do in that job. Maybe you oversee a team. Maybe you oversee some sort of leadership. Uh, you're, you know, you got promoted to assistant manager. You can mention that in the application as well. That all looks very favorably uh, towards, the, towards the reviewer. Don't talk badly about the job, even if you got fired from it. Um, just don't, don't disparage anything, anybody else in the application. Uh, overall, the application is for you to, uh, to brag about yourself, but it's also for you to, um, what's the word I'm looking for? Uh, kind of demean yourself to a certain degree to show that you're not, you know, nobody's perfect. So we have got to be humble. That's what I wanted to, to really want to say. So be positive in that. All right, let's talk about leadership. Are you looking for a virtual leadership opportunities that would be good for your applications? Just shouting out pre-health shadowing over here. Um, if you guys Excellent. are interested in gaining some leadership opportunities, be sure to check out the application on our website. This is a student-led program. And if you guys are looking for something to help you during this COVID-19 pandemic, um, definitely consider applying. We are taking students from not only the US, but the world. Um, so it's a wonderful opportunity for you all. Excellent. Look at that. More people joining. Looks good. There we go. All right. The other, another qualitative aspect of the application is clinical experience. Uh, <clears throat> again, we want to make sure that you are understanding what you're getting into as far as a lifelong um, opportunity. So your clinical experience should be relative to the profession that you're seeking. I think I spelled profession wrong. No, it might be right. Anyway. Um, in other words, if you want to be a, a physician, uh, shadowing a veterinarian really isn't going to be as productive. It's not a bad thing, but it shouldn't be the, the thing you only do. So make it kind of relative to what you are looking for. Uh, what most reviewers are looking for is a variety of shadowing or clinical experiences. So a variety is better than one long clinical experience. Now, if your clinical experience is a job, then we go in back in. That's a combination of what we just spoke about as far as work experience and clinical experience. If you're the, the most common thing that uh, applicants are doing now is scribing in hospitals or clinics. Uh, if you are scribing and wanna continue to scribe, go for it. I think it's a good way to get clinical experience and uh, make a little bit of money. I don't know how, how much scribes make. I don't think it's a lot, but it's, it helps. So scribing is a big, is a big profession that I've seen in applications lately, which, which is good. Um, what I would ask as a scribe is, is if you can scribe for different positions, um, not just one, but, uh, scribing is not a bad thing. On the application, you want to, again, explain your duties briefly, because we <clears throat> want to have a little bit of idea of what that clinical experience was. Uh, same as the work experience, don't talk poorly about any other professional uh, or any personnel that were in the clinic that you were looking at. And as always, we want to be aspiring, inspiring. Am I okay on time? <laughs> okay. Yeah, you can get on time. Okay, good. Thank you. Disciplinary history. I want to spend a little bit of time on this because I've, I have the poor job of um, 
uh, being involved in this uh, in my in my current role. Disciplinary history. It won't keep you out of med school if you've been slapped on the wrist for something. Like I said, academic probations. I know a lot of people that are in med school. I say med school, but I mean healthcare professions um, in general, um, because they, you know, because they were in academic probation. Even a slight misdemeanor, if you've had some some encounters with law enforcement, those can be explained away if you do it right. All right. But the first thing you wanna be doing is be honest. You wanna make sure it is on your application because guess what? They all do background checks and our background check company is very, very thorough. So even if it's been expunged or if your lawyer tells you not to do it because you know it's been dropped or whatever, somehow the background, as long as you've been charged for something, uh, the background check will find it. And a lot of deans and a lot of admissions committees do not like discrepancies between a background check and an application, all right? It doesn't necessarily mean you're gonna stay out of that school. It just um, means that you're honest when you note it on the application, all right? So be honest and forthright about it. Explain the issue so that the reviewer understands what happened, okay? Uh, so explain it thoroughly. The next three are um, pretty important. What you wanna do is take ownership for that issue for that that problem that you had or that issue that you had uh, yes it's my fault I did it and I shouldn't you know and, and then what you did to remediate the problem well I took alcohol classes or you know I cleaned up afterwards or I cleaned the dorm floor whatever whatever the thing might be but what did you do to pay for that that issue and then also what did you learn from that all right so the worst thing I can read or I can hear in an interview is when somebody has a, we'll say a, a minor in possession, we'll say, all right, that's a common one I see. Um, so they, you know, that one guy told me while I was at a party, the cops came and they were just being real tough and they were just trying to make a quota. So they gave me a MIP. I didn't deserve it. I didn't, I didn't have a beer in my hand. I had a couple, but I didn't have a beer in my hand. That's not the way to do it. Okay. You want to take ownership. You were at the party and you had been drinking, okay, I did it, I screwed up, but this is how I'm fixing it, and I learned from my mistake, all right? Take ownership, learn from that mistake, and take ownership on what you did. So that's going to get you a lot further in that, in that, in that application, all right? Hopefully there's some questions about that. What I have to do is when people are um, not authentic or not forthright, their background check comes up with a, uh, an issue, their application did not have an issue and they have really no reason why they didn't put it on their application. The deans will say, we don't want them. And it's my job to write them or call them and tell them we don't want them even after they've been accepted. It's not a fun job. So don't make me do it. Okay, letters of recommendation. We talked briefly about those. Um, one thing you wanna look for is how many letters are required from that school? Okay, most of the time it's two or three, all right? Uh, most of our programs are two or three. So um, when, the recommend, when the minimum recommendation is two or three, please don't write 11, don't request 11 of rec letters of recommendation because guess what? The other eight probably won't be looked at. I, I review literally a thousand or 2000 applications per year. My staff does at least that many, uh, probably more. So when there's 11 letters of recommendation and they've got 500 applications to look at for the, in the next week or two, um, you know, they're not going to waste their time looking at relevant, irrelevant letters of recommendation. All right. Two or three is pretty good. Four sometimes is good too. Um, we do look to see who the authors or to referees are for those. And for instance, if you did a lot of community service work and you got a letter from your community service supervisor or the person that oversaw that's, that organization, I'll read that, okay? We'll read those relevant uh, letters. So don't include too many of those. One thing you wanna do, and I got a little story involved with this, develop a relationship with the referee. The referee is per the person that writes the, the recommendation, okay? So you wanna develop a relationship, even though it's minimal, uh, you may wanna get a letter from say a research uh, person that you did research with, with your PI or uh, your assistant research, assistant, whatever it is, um, but make sure they know who you are. Um, my story is there was a, an applicant once 
that I was reviewing the application and the the name on it, the first name on it was was pretty general neutral. So um, the application indicated that this was a male, um, but the letter of recommendation indicated that it was a female. So I wanted to find out who this was just because I was interviewing them and I didn't I didn't want to be um, rude or insensitive or anything. So I I called the person that wrote the letter. He was an anatomy professor at a school and I won't name the school. It's in Southeast Florida. But anyway, um, but he's, yeah, you know, I asked him, I said, hey, tell me a little bit about this person. And so he commenced to telling me, well, they sent me an email. They were in my anatomy class. Um, I think they sat towards the front most of the time. And he finally fessed up. He said, well, typically if a student gets a good grade in my class and they email me, I'll write them a, a generic letter of reference. So I just lost all credibility for that faculty member and most of the ones in his school. So, um, and that was detrimental to that student, even though they didn't have any control over it. Um, they, they asked a, a professor that they didn't know very well to write them a letter of recommendation. So develop that relationship, whether it be through office hours, that's how common um, letters, that's how common those relationships, how commonly those relationships are developed. Uh, whether it's through research activity or a volunteer activity, uh, et cetera. So I, I want to see something in the letter of reference that says, I knew applicant from uh, working at such and such from, we, we both worked in the nursing home. We both did research together. She was in my, she came to office hours very frequently and we got to develop a relationship. Things like that. You really want to develop those relationships. There's a little key on the a little uh, radio dial in the application that, that asks you if you want to waive your rights to see the letter. Uh, it, you can do it either way you want. I'm gonna suggest that you waive your rights to see the letter. In other words, you don't wanna see them because that shows that the, that the letter writer is probably a little bit more honest in his letter writing. That's just an impression. It's not 100% true, but it's an impression that a lot of reviewers have when they read the application. So that's just a recommendation from me to you. Okay, let's do a couple of these. Uh, I want you guys to be the admissions. Now this is, a, I hate Zoom because you can't feedback very easily. Um, unless Nina, you know how, and I don't. But, um, oh, cool. So I want you guys to be the admissions committee based on what things we've said. We've got some characteristics of this student. Uh, for instance, GPA is a 3.5 science, 3.45 cumulative. They're a bio major. They have a DAT. This list is a dental student of uh, 22. The average DAT in the United States is a 19. So that's above average. Clinical hours, they have 1,000 hours as a dental assistant, shadowed three dentists. They're a dental assistant volunteer. They're a certified dental assistant, excuse me. So they've actually gone to school to be a dental assistant. Uh, they're a president of the pre-dental club on their campus. They serve 50 hours in the food pantry volunteer. Um, in their letters of recommendation, the recommenders mentioned their work ethic, their personality and maturity. Uh, during the interview, it says they displayed, um, now I can't see it, sorry. Displayed, uh, they said they displayed appropriate um, communication skills. Uh, they did good shadowing, et cetera. So, uh, so is this person accepted or was this person put on Re rejected or person I'm put on a waiting list? You tell me guys. The poll is a great idea, Nina, thank you. Thank you. Yeah, we have 73% uh, answered. When I get 80% responses, I'll go ahead and release Excellent. it. Excellent. All righty. This one's kind Here of an easy you. one. Yeah, so you guys got it. Yeah, of course this, guy's good. this guy got in. He's a good student. They did all the, they're good in the GPA is pretty good. That's generally an average for some schools. Some med schools are a little higher, but that's a pretty good average to be in. Uh, the, the qualitative aspects, the, they're in a food pantry, they got a good work ethic, they're president in the pre-dent club, so that shows some leadership, et cetera, and they are very involved clinically, so that's a good applicant. So let's go to the next one. I've got three of these. <clears throat> Excuse me. Again, GPA is a little lower. They're a business major, but they did a master's in biomed science, with, and the master's GPA is a little higher. Again, a dental student with a, a DAT, they took it twice. So one of the questions you might ask is taking a, a standardized test more than once a detriment or is it a good thing? Um, so they got a 17 and 19. Again, average data is 19. Clinical, they work three mission trips. 
Again, they were a certified assistant uh, during high school and uh, got a certification as a dental assistant at CNA as a nursing assistant. So they have nursing experience and certified dental assistant certification two years ago. They were on the college basketball team and they were captain and they were promoted to shift lead emergency medical technician. So they got some leadership. Volunteers, a dental assistant, like we said, the youth basketball coach, strong worth ethic and team player in the letters of rec. The interview, was, they were humble, professional, well-spoken. However, this one had an MIP, which is a minor in possession of alcohol during their freshman year. And they are a reapplicant. So what do you guys think? Were they accepted? Were they waitlisted? Or were they rejected? Good. So it's a little more, okay, waitlisted was a good answer, but this person was actually accepted uh, because of their, those qualitative aspects. And again, an MIP won't keep you out of healthcare school, uh, but they owned it. I remember this application, they owned it. And uh, it was a while ago, all right? Since the freshman year, they stayed clean. They did things. If you've got two or more violations, you got to really think what you're doing, number one. And number two, you're, you're logarithmically lowering your chances to get into healthcare or school. But this person had one, and it was the freshman year, which we all know. So I better not say. There are probably some freshmen out there. But you're, you've got a little bit of growing to do before your senior year. So we know that, okay? So that was a good one. And the reapplicant also shows persistence. So just because you get denied the first year doesn't mean your life is over. It doesn't mean that um, the school hates you, all right? And we'll explain a little bit about that later. Last one here. Uh, again, this is a dental. I should have, should have made the test a little different. But anyway, GPA is really high, double major, bio and chem, uh, a little above average on the standardized test. Good shadowing, right at the limited shadowing hours, it was in his mom's office, another 50 hours with the associates in the same office, assisted in dental office for a year. Um, and again, it was his mother's. Uh, no real leadership experience listed. 20 hours in mother's weekend free clinic. Um, letters of recs, question true motivation for dentistry. And I will read those in, in letters of recommendation. Um, there's really no why as to why they wanna be a dentist. Didn't interact well um, during campus tour. He was not paying attention, that kind of thing. So this one, I think, may or may not be obvious. But yep, the double major bio and chem. What do you guys think? Above average, so the, all the quantitative things are good. Yep, you guys got it again. You're sharp. Uh, this person was rejected primarily because the qualitative things were terrible. 100 hours in mother's office, yeah, don't, don't shadow in a relative's office. Um, that's, that's most of the time that's, that's explained to you in the uh, website that you're gonna look at, okay? Now, having no leadership is not, is not a detriment to your application, all right? Just means you really haven't had a chance. So that won't keep you out. That's not the reason they were rejected. It's just that you know, the real reason this guy was rejected was um, the interview and the letters of recommendation because of motivation. Motivation is a key component in showing how, why you want to be in uh, dental school or healthcare school, right? Okay, good job. You guys did a great, great job. So I'm just going to wind this up. And I, I really want to advocate from an admission standpoint. I'm an admissions guy. I have, I have about five or six um, staff members where all they do is advise students. That's their job is to advise students to be a competitive applicant, how to do the, an interview. We do virtual events all year long on how to improve your application, things like that. So I wanna urge you all contact your local admissions office. If it's my admissions office, that's great. You'll be in good hands. Most medical school dental admissions offices will help you with this. They will help you with application advisement. They will help you with transcript review, how to write a personal statement feedback and interview tips, things like that. So reach out to them. They will help you be a more competitive applicant. All right. In case you care, this is just because I want to do some self-promotion. This is me. This is my office. And that's my students graduating. And that's Kirksville, Missouri.
So thank you and for allowing me to talk for this long. Happy to answer any questions you have. You guys just have to show me where to get them from. <laughs> Thank you so much for your amazing presentation. The little interactive part at the end was super fun. Um, and we'll go ahead, me and Rose, the other co-hosts, we're just gonna kind of go back and forth um, asking the questions that we've compiled from the chat. So I'll go ahead and start with that for you. Um, and we talked a lot about kind of what experiences you should have and you know what looks good or not for the applications. And a student asked, would it be a red flag to have some dental clinical experience for medical school applications? No, no, that's not a, that's not a red flag at all. Um, it's still clinical experience nonetheless. Uh, I wouldn't make it the majority of your experiences, make it a small part because it, you know, um, there may be certain, certain circumstances, maybe you were looking in a dentistry, which to me that looks good because you were exploring different avenues. And if you did a little bit of dental, dental shadowing and then the majority of the rest of them were medical shadowing, that shows me that, yeah, you, you've looked into this. You did some work and looked into it. So, so no, it's not a detriment at all. Thank you for that. Our next question is, um, how do you feel about applicants who have a bachelor's degree, but in an unrelated topic such as science or medicine? Doesn't matter what your bachelor's degree is in. Um, you know what I found out makes really, really good applicants is music majors. Um, people that have majored in music are very technically technically orientated. They're very hard workers because, <clears throat> pardon me, having a music degree is a lot of work. Um, so no, you don't need a biology degree or a biomed science degree to, to get into these programs, but you do have to demonstrate that you can handle the sciences. So uh, not only, you know, that I would recommend, I've seen a lot of, of students have just the prerequisites done. Uh, I would recommend taking one or two higher level courses in science, just to make sure that you can handle the rigors of that first year of, of healthcare school. Um, so no, you can be any major you want. We get them from all over the place. Thank you so much. Another question that I have is kind of about leadership. And they're asking, what are some unique leadership, leadership examples that you've seen or read on applications? Oh gosh, specific leadership examples. Um, being promoted to manager at a job or assistant manager, something like that uh, is, a, is a big leadership, obviously where you, where you have to govern people, some, some form or another. Um, I interviewed a, a, a young lady from Arkansas once who was the head of this fraternity or, or sorority, I get those confused, uh, at the University of Arkansas and it was like 400 people. That's pretty impressive leadership skills when you can go to school and she also worked um, and she also had some other, out, uh, other activities that she was doing but yet she was the leader of the sorority for 400 different people. Now she didn't correspond with all 400, but she managed a network of people that managed others. So uh, things like that are not saying you have to manage 400 people, but um, leaders, leading people are examples for leadership. All right, if you lead dogs as a dog walker, not quite as strong as being a manager or um, an organizational leader is another leadership aspect, whatever organization that might be. Go ahead. Thank you. So the next question we have for you is how do med schools look at people who have attended graduate school before applying to med school? Depends on the graduate school. Okay. Are you talking like a master's degree or another professional school? Because those are the, those are both graduate and they're different. Um, I'm assuming they were asking about masters. Okay. I'll kind of adjust. I'll, let me just answer both while I'm while I'm thinking about it, if that's okay. Um, one trait that we like medical, and I keep saying medical, I'm sorry, healthcare professional school students to have is persistence, okay? Because the old saying goes, if you haven't failed in life, guess where you're going to fail is in graduate school because it's, it's something that you've not really encountered before. Um, so having, a master's degree or pursuing that master's degree or a post back degree is really, to me, it's an asset to some people because they're doing it for a reason. Um, they're doing it either, they may have not taken a lot of science in their undergraduate course and they do the master's to really bone up on the science or their GPA is a little lower than the undergrad and they're really doing that to, 
to beef up the GPA. Either one of those reasons tells me that, okay, they know what they want to do because the master's degree is no small dedication, right? You have to dedicate some time to that and some energy. So for me, that's an asset. Uh, now, if you have if you entered, say, say you want to be, um, say you're applying for dental school and you've already, you were in your first year of medical school, okay? Um, we have that quite often actually, which is not, not a bad thing. But on the application, you're really gonna have to explain motivation. Okay, that's going to be a big factor in your personal statement. Why did you go to medical school and why did you convert to dental school? Uh, and if you say things like, well, it's better hours and, and you know, better pay, stay in, stay in medical school because you're not going to get into dental school. All right. So you really have to word those word, be a wordsmith and look at how uh, you're wording those reasons or not necessarily the wording, but you have to look at your heart and say, why am I doing this? And then and then kind of iterate that on the application. Should it help? Yes, that does. Thank you so okay. much. Kind Absolutely. of a question going off of that one um, is what is your advice for someone who doesn't get into medical school their first time applying? If they take a year to retry, how would you suggest they make the most out of that year? Great question. I love this question because my answer is call me. Okay. Not me specifically, but call somebody. We There are schools that have admissions personnel that know how to um, make your application more competitive. If you know anybody that's in a certain health profession, reach out to them. Don't try to do this all yourself. This is a team effort. <coughs> Excuse me. This is a team effort to do this. Uh, people that try to do this all themselves are at a great disadvantage because we talked about the personal, I'm going to kind of tangent a little bit. We talked about the personal statement. One of the biggest mistakes people make in that is they don't proofread that personal statement. They don't have other people proofread that for personal statement. Much like if you get rejected, have somebody else look at your application and see what, what they think you can do to, in, to improve upon it. Don't just look at it and say, okay, well, my, my MCAT was a little weaker, so I'll just take the MCAT. Because you chances are you won't get any direct feedback to why you were rejected, okay? Even the admissions person won't know, necessarily know why exactly you were rejected. What they can do is they can look at your application, look at weak areas and show you how to improve upon those. All right. Because the school, you know, the admissions committees don't have to have a reason. They just say reject most of the time. <clears throat> so reach out to somebody. And uh, by the way, like I said before, medical, you know, healthcare professions are very competitive. So if you do get rejected your first time out, please don't be discouraged by that. Do it. I, I, for, <laughs> My one, excuse me again, my one example is uh, a guy when I was with the Arizona School of Dentistry, um, he had applied for dental school six times and had improved his application every time. And yes, the first application he did was really terrible, but, but he applied six times, which to me shows, yes, okay, this guy definitely wants to be a dentist. And his still, his marks weren't that, <coughs> excuse me, that outstanding. But what he did do was he was persistent. He was persistent in what he wanted to do. And he was able to do the sixth time. He was able to show us, the admissions committee, that that's what he wanted to do. And we said, geez, after six times, and he's improved it every time. He got involved in the school. He knew students and things like that. And we're going, we, you know, and it turned out he's a terrific dentist and a terrific guy. <clears throat> I have this little tickle in my throat. Excuse me. Go ahead. Thank you so much. Uh, so steering away from admissions, could you speak about your day-to-day -day life as a chiropractor? <laughs> oh gosh. Um, well, it's been quite a few years since I was a chiropractor, but um, let me go deep in the memory banks and try to think of what it was. My day-to-day -day was, um, the fun part of my day was the people. And I hope that's why you're getting into the healthcare because you want to deal with people. Um, you're going to deal with good. You're going to deal with bad. I had some real a-holes at my practice that I dealt, had to deal with, but you know what you focus on? You focus on those people that are very appreciative of what you do and that you enjoy being around and any kind of healthcare profession, the, the best thing you're going to have is that person thanks you and says that really helped, or I feel a lot better. Or even if, you know, if it was something detrimental happened to a family member, but the, the other family member said, you know what, you did that well and you did all you could. I appreciate it. That's what makes you go day to day. 
Um, in my day to day as a chiropractor was, you know, you, you see patients. Uh, I, I just, I got sick of seeing one thing. I'm, I'm really a variety kind of guy. So um, I liked, I tried to diversify what I was doing, but, um, and that's, that's what I liked about what I did. I, I took up and I have a fellowship in clinical acupuncture. So later on in my career, I took up that. I did a little bit of acupuncture, um, did different techniques as I went through. But um, my day-to-day was I worked as an associate to begin with. So I worked for somebody so I could gain some experience. Plus I was flat broke when I, when I left chiropractic college. And then um, I gained enough to at least afford a little bit of a practice. So I went, my wife and I actually ran the practice, which I don't recommend you do. Um, don't ever work with a spouse. But anyway, we're still together after 31 years. But um, um, so yeah, it's, uh, I worked and I had my own practice for 12 years and really, really enjoyed it. I loved seeing the patients. And what you'll find out is your patients are conditioned to you. So you're, what happens is, obviously you're not gonna treat patients that you don't like or don't like you. So you kind of weed those out without even trying. So my practice turned into people that I look forward to seeing every day because it was like going to see an old friend. And I think most of the healthcare workers will say the same, same thing. Um, you know, it depends on your personality. I'm not, a, I'm not a guy that likes a lot of conflict. Some people do, I don't. So that's what I turn my practice into. So I don't know what, I, I hope I answered that question. I'm not sure what day-to-day really means. You know, they come in, I adjusted them, they left, they paid a little bit, not much. Uh, and then the next one came, that was pretty much day-to-day. <laughs> well, thank you so much for sharing that with us. That is some <laughs> advice in there. And I think lots of us love to hear when, you know, you talk about the relationships you have with patients. Um, yeah. Hopping back onto the admissions side, <laughs> um, can you talk about what kind of research experience professional schools look for? Well, not with any degree of, of certainty. So our our school is not research heavy, and but uh, we do like research. So what the kind of research they, they do like doing uh, is something maybe on a clinical side, maybe something more relevant to medicine. Um, I again, I don't have a great answer to that question. I wish I did. Um, but anything in the sciences is a good is a good research project. Anything where you're a uh, even a research assistant, or even when you're washing out beakers, at least you're finding out you're experiencing that that uh, in your in your life, which is a, you know can be an important part of of healthcare. So um, I, I say it. We don't look at it highly. We do look at it. It is an important part of the application and part of the pre-health activities, um, but it really, we don't have any specific type of research that we look into. Uh, we have even people that are doing clinical research in psychology. Um, they don't all have to do bench research on protein synthesis. It's not all necessary to do that, nor is it a, a, a hand up if you do in our schools. Some schools there are. Some schools your second and third year are doing a little bit of clinical and a lot of research. So, I mean, it just varies on which school you go to. And um, that leads me into another another topic if I might tangent one more time. So um, speaking of research schools, speaking of clinical schools, there are however many medical schools, however many healthcare schools across the nation, and, and they all are good because they're accredited by the same people, all right? Whatever you graduate from, you're gonna be a competent um, health, healthcare worker, healthcare professional. But what you wanna do is in the application and the interview process is find out what, what school suits you. So the biggest thing we're looking for is will you be a good fit in class? And what you want to look for as you're looking for school is will you be a good fit in class or will the school fit you? So what you want to do is you want to find out what, you know, there are some people that have just a passion for, for working with people, which is terrific. And they have a passion for working with the underserved, which I was happy to hear about your mission here at pre-health shadowing, because that's our mission at, at ATSU. Uh, we are partnered with National Health, National Association of Clinical uh, Community Health Centers, excuse me. So our mission is to get healthcare workers, healthcare professionals in areas of need. All right, up the soapbox. But anyway, what you wanna do is look for that school that fits you. Is research your bag? Then by all means, look at those schools where research is much more important aspect of, 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 of the education. 
Ours is more clinic. We, my, our mission says we want to educate clinically competent healthcare professionals. So we work on more clinical skills, diagnostic skills, things like that. So, um, but you will still have a chance to do research. I'm not trying to shorten that or say there's a difference. You just kind of have to find out what school is going to be good for you. If you do a shotgun approach at applying to schools, uh, you're, you're number one, you're wasting money. Uh, and number two, you're going to come up short in the end. So don't do a shotgun approach. Make sure you make some time, spend some time at it and find out what school you really want to pursue. Sorry, I went on a little tangent. Hope I answered your question. You definitely did. And thank you so much for that tangent. It really means a lot to, <laughs> I'm sure to all of us. Uh, so what do um, admission community, uh, committees, I'm sorry, look upon gap years? How do they feel about it? Well, that, that attitude has changed over the last, gosh, 10 years since I've been doing it. Um, because at first it was really frowned upon because they're saying, well, you're, you're doing something frivolous. You're not doing what you're supposed to be doing and, and focusing on the health profession. But what we're also finding out is that people are taking that year to concentrate on their application, to do more clinical shadowing, to do more clinical experience. So that's what the majority of, of the applicants are doing. And if that's what you're doing, that's not going to hurt you a darn bit. If you have your gap year and you go off to Europe and, and backpack through the Alps and then come in and expect school, it's going to be a little tougher. Not impossible, but it'll be a little tougher. Um, but what you want to do is that gap year is you don't want to study necessarily, but go, keep shadowing, keep doing your clinical experiences, that kind of thing. So, um, so you know, to answer your question, it depends, but uh, it's not, you know, it's not a death sentence by any means. Thank you. Next, um, a question, you know, that pertains directly to you and your field of work. How do you feel about shadowing for the admissions process? How do I feel about shadowing? Um, uh, for virtual shadowing during the Virtual school. shadowing. Oh, wow. You know, it's, it's so new. Um, here's what COVID did for us as admissions people. It forced us to accept a lot of stuff. Uh, it forced us to look upon uh, pass-fail grades. It forced us to put less weight on standardized tests. It forced us to do a lot of things. Um, and I think one thing that really it forced us to do is virtual interviews. And now that we can do virtual interviews and that we're, most of us are fairly comfortable with them, I think they're going now, they're saying, eh, virtual shadowing might not be so bad, okay? Um, Obviously it's not as good as person to person, but I think COVID has forced us into certain circumstances that at, you know, it's better than nothing. Let's put it that way. So virtual shadowing for me and for right now, I think for my admissions committee, they would look favorably upon it because it's certainly better than not, no shadowing at all. It means again, you're trying to work towards that. You're doing everything you can to um, understand what the healthcare profession is all about. So I think the, the, the attitude is, is growing more favorably toward virtual shadowing. That's really good to hear. Um, <laughs> so our next question is, should this person personally has healthcare experience in high school, should they add it in their application or is that too far behind? No, nope. high school stuff is very good to add to. Now, <clears throat> as long as there's consistency, all right. If your only healthcare experience is in high school, that's not going to look very favorably because we want to make sure there's consistency all along the way. But if it goes back as far as high school, that shows again your your motivation, your willingness to do that. You've been doing it so many years and you're still passionate about it. So yeah, go back to high school. The application is really a time for you to brag. Um, and here's another another tangent I'm going to go on since you brought that up. Uh, but in your, the, all the applications will give you an area to list about um, work experience and like the, the experiences that we broke down, clinical experience and shadowing experience, uh, list those out one by one. Don't say I shadowed four doctors for 50 hours. List those doctors for so many hours, even if it's 10, 10, and 10, you still, they still know your, your um consistency and you're still pursuing. So it looks a lot better to list everything out, brag about it. Don't try to scrunch it in. You've got the room. All right. If you've done that much shadowing where you have to scrunch it in, boy, you've done a lot of shadowing. Okay. So um, list those out in the, in the application, brag about what you're doing, including high school stuff. 
Thank you for that advice. I think that's important to know for everybody here who is getting shadowing right now. Mm -hmm. <laughs> virtually. But virtually, uh, no. yes. <laughs> So we talked about the importance of authenticity in your applications and in your interviews. And so in your opinion, what makes someone seem more passionate or inspiring when they're talking about their experiences? Oh, that's, um, gosh. Being truthful about it. I mean, you, we're hoping that you want to do what you're looking to do, right? Um, there are, um, what do you call it? You know, subtle subtleties that we pick up as interviewers you know we're not all psychologists but you guys can see it when you talk to your friends when something is wrong right you know immediately when something's wrong when we when we talk about because i i do this hundreds of times a year so when somebody is not authentic or they're not exactly sure or um not you know not 100 percent into it um i can tell okay we can tell as interviewers but what you want to do is be honest about it. When you're honest about something and it's truly a passion of yours, it'll come out. Can you tell I love what I'm doing? Because I'm passionate about this stuff. I really am because I, I, get, I see, you know, uh, I do gestures. I, I have fluctuation in my voice. I'm not monotone. I'm not sitting in, in one chair, in one position in my chair. I'm very um, um, animate about what I'm doing. Not saying you have to do that in the interview. That's not what I'm saying. But I'm saying you have to do what makes you most comfortable in that interview. Because um, so I I hope that helps answer your question. Um, but it's going to be the little subtleties. But the, the biggest thing is don't try to cover anything up because we'll be able to figure that out right away. Yeah, definitely. I can tell that you're passionate about it, and it makes you very <laughs> happy to listen to. And it makes me happy to be here, and I hope it does everybody else. Good. Um, Good. Next, uh, you did talk about, you know, how a lot of applicants are going through school and work and how impressive that is. And we have a student asking if it's very important through the admissions eyes um, to be working throughout college. Is it very important? No, it is not. So for instance, if you don't need to work or can't work for whatever reason, that's not a bad thing. As long as you're doing something though, we want to make sure and something towards your goal. All right. Um, even if it's certain student organizations or a lot of people do church work, things like that, those are all really good um, because you know we all went to college and if you just go to class, we have an idea of what you're doing outside of class if you're not doing anything else or if you're not listing anything else, right? It's probably not all good because you didn't list it on the application. But if you're doing other things, no, it's not, it's not truly uh, necessary that you, have a, that you are employed but it is necessary that you are exploring other avenues, all right? Because we don't want that tunnel vision of you're only taking organic chemistry that semester or you're only in the sciences. We want you to be able to have a social life as, uh, as well. Healthcare is all about a balance. It's all about a work-life balance. It's all about being well and talk about wellness. So we want you as a student to be that way too. So we don't want you to be, um, this is why when I said it was hard, I, you guys are amazing in what you do because we, we look at all of these different aspects of your life and what you're doing and you're all doing it and you're all doing it successfully. <clears throat> so if you are, I'll tell you a little story. I interviewed this guy once. Uh, he looked like the Sheldon on Big Bang Theory. He was a little tall and skinny and uh, had a, like a 4.5 GPA. He was an MCAT of a, you know, a stout, this was before the, the MCAT switched, but it was a really, really high MCAT, like the highest we'd seen so far that year. Um, and of course, you know, we gave him an interview because he, he filled out the application. Okay. He came in for an interview um, and he hadn't done anything else. And he was um, a, a nerd. I mean, I don't, we're all nerds, but that's not what I meant. He, he complained because our apples at lunch weren't sliced. Uh, he didn't, he didn't like the idea that we didn't have a catered lunch. Uh, he didn't like the idea that we didn't ask certain questions in our school in the interview. So, and when I was interviewing him, he was yes and no. He was, yes, I did. And he was very conceited. So after his third year in medical school, <laughs> I'm kidding. <laughs> he got rejected. Okay. But we didn't like him at all. Um, I can't remember why I told that story. I got lost my train of thought. Anyway, but my, my overall goal was he was not authentic. He was not what we wanted in that school. 
because he didn't do anything else. He was just the student and he was darn good at it. He was a really good student, um, but that's all he did. He didn't have any experience talking to people. We knew that by the way he talked to people in the interview. He didn't have any experience with outside people. So we like that outside experience. So if, if you get that through a job, that's great. If you don't get it through a job, that's fine, but we want you to do something. A long answer to a short question. Thank you. <laughs> so uh, right now we're going to make this a little bit more interactive. So Marissa, would you like to go ahead and ask your question? Yeah, so um, there are a lot of questions in the chat about being like a non-traditional student, which can mean a lot of things. Um, but I was wondering, um, a lot of people nowadays, um, for various reasons, will take a four year degree in like four and a half years or five years. So if there's a legitimate reason for like, you know, like being a little bit behind, as long as you're always doing things outside of school um, and maintaining a good work ethic, would med schools look down on that? Or is that just something that you would be sure to like talk about and bring up to them so that they know why that you did that? Uh, yes, no, medical schools don't look down upon that. But yes, to the rest of your statement is, so yeah, we look at a lot of non-traditional students, a lot of students that were in one career and changed their mind. I just talked to a student yesterday that was an engineer for a number of years prior to, prior to med school. So I think one of the biggest, re, one of the biggest things that the committee or uh, the reviewer is gonna look at is, uh, you said it in your question, you know, they were always working towards that goal, which is great. You know, maybe they had some obstacles that they overcame, which is even better because that's again, persistence and some grit, which we'll, we can talk about too. That's our, the new admissions four letter word is grit. Um, some intestinal fortitude in order to make it into medical school. So, um, you know, those, the, as long as you're doing something, just like you said, I don't care if I've, I've interviewed people that are my age and yes, I'm old. So, which have a, just as good a chance, as long as they did the right thing, to get into med school as somebody that's, a, that's a, just graduated from college. So, um, so it really is all about what that application shows. Uh, and as long as it shows your persistence and your willingness and your motivation to be in that healthcare profession, then yeah, you've got just as good a chance as anybody else. Okay, thank you. Thanks, Marissa. Okay, so at this time, we unfortunately have no more time for questions. So do you have any last minute advice you'd like to give? Oh, gosh. Um, be flexible, be patient. Uh, this is not an easy process. Um, you know, don't, ex don't go in there with any high expectations that you're gonna nail it in one year. Sometimes you don't. A lot of, the majority of people don't get into med school the first year uh, because just for the number of applications that we see every year, it's a very competitive uh, environment. Um, so be patient, be flexible, take your time in filling out that application. Enjoy life while you're doing it as well. Learn a lot, but enjoy life and uh, reach out to others. Don't be a silo. Awesome. Well, thank you so much um, for joining us and spending your time with us here today. I know Absolutely. that this information um, is really helpful for all of our students who are looking to apply to various health programs. And so hopefully our students um, really pay attention today during this presentation. For all of our students um, looking to get their virtual shadowing hours verified, uh, please listen up. Sorry, my camera. <laughs> All right, so I am going to be sharing a presentation. Um, this is just a little reflection time for you guys as you guys uh, participate in our virtual shadowing opportunities. We encourage you to write down your initial thoughts um, as this is really helpful going into uh, writing your personal statement um, and just kind of keeping in touch with what you were feeling at that time and how that has changed your perspective or enhanced your perspective on something. Alrighty, and if you are looking to get published, again, we are taking submissions for um, students who are interested in being published on the official Pre-Health Shadowing website. You guys can do this by going to the website, prehealthshadowing.com slash blog submissions. This is an exclusive opportunity currently only available to those participating in our live sessions. So if you guys are interested, you can submit articles uh, regarding your journey, path, any tips that you may have reflections about specific virtual shadowing sessions, reviews of our program, or success stories. So be sure to check that out. 
Again, we do have our mentorship uh, networking opportunity to gain an invitation. You're going to want to download the materials from our Google Drive, register as a volunteer on our website, and post this on your social media. Once you get all the boxes filled up, you're going to submit your final board and you will receive your invitation to RSVP. It is that easy. So not only can you gain a lifelong mentor, you can also help support um, Pre-Health Shadowing as a nonprofit student-led organization as we work to uh, facilitate connections among various students nationally and globally. Be sure to tag us in your posts at Pre-Health Shadowing whenever you do anything cool. Um, and also use the hashtag Pre-Health Shadowing. We'd love to see what our students are accomplishing. Um, you can get reposted on the official Pre-Health Shadowing account. You can get reposted on TikTok, Instagram, Facebook, and Twitter. If you guys are interested in making content for Pre-Health Shadowing, you can also do so as a volunteer and get virtual volunteering hours for this. So please keep us free for everybody. Pre-Health Shadowing is a wonderful resource, not only for students in general, but students uh, of minority groups or um, various socioeconomic statuses. So we are really working to provide these opportunities for students to gain um, a leg up in a society that has always been pushing them down. Um, and so if you guys are interested in joining um, our fundraising team, you guys can get volunteering hours for this as well. And so if you guys are lacking on your volunteer hours due to COVID, now is your time to get back in the game. Um, you can help us raise money by sharing this link. For every 15 shares, you get one hour of volunteering. We are taking leadership applications. If you're interested in joining and becoming a member of the Pre-Health Shadowing student team, uh, you can apply online on our website, prehealthshadowing.com slash join our team. Um, this is 100% remote in observance of the pandemic. Um, you get the opportunity to meet with like-minded students and uh, reach out to various professionals um, in a wide range of fields. Um, it looks great on applications and it gives you something to talk about. Um, you know, you'll be leading a team of students as a leader in this program. And so not only maintaining connections with uh, various students from around the world, but also starting your own project, creating an initiative and um, leading that yourself as well. We understand you guys are all pre-health students and time is not something you just have in your back pocket. So if you guys are interested in getting involved but do not have the time to commit at the moment, that is completely fine. We are still taking volunteers. And so if you guys are looking to help out, maybe you only have two hours a week or maybe sometimes you're not sure if you can help out at all, that is more than okay. We are taking um, sign ups. So you can do this on our website, prealshadowing.com slash volunteer. And at the end, if you need a certificate to send in to the various institutions that you're applying for, you can get those upon request. We have another virtual shadowing session today uh, with Annie Thatcher Stevens, who is a certified athletic trainer. Um, if you guys are interested in joining, that will be at 2.30 p.m. Pacific Standard Time. So be sure to sign up on our website, prehealthshadowing.com slash sessions. Last but not least, how to get your certificate verifying your virtual shadowing hours today. You're going to go to our website, prehealthshadowing.com, and find our professional for today's session. You're going to click free, take this course, and it will lead you to the post-shadowing assessment, where you will have 30 minutes and two tries to get over a 70%. The moment you get over 70%, I recommend downloading your certificate immediately. You can also find it at all times in your profile under the certificates tab. I also do recommend if you pass with a 70 the first time, please just get your certificate. Um, I know everybody wants to do, you know, get 100%, um, but it will not show up whether you get a 70 or a 100. And so I recommend as soon as you secure your certificate, grab it. If you do decide to take the post-shadowing assessment for a second time and end up not passing it, you will no longer be eligible for your certificate. I cannot stress this enough. Um, please ensure that you download it. You're still eligible, eligible to take it um, if you do not pass it and you have another shot to pass it. But once you pass it, just grab it and go. Thank you, everybody. And if you have any questions or issues while taking the post-shadowing assessment, be sure to reach out to us at prehealthshadowing.com, info at prehealthshadowing.com. There is a contact form as well on our website if you need that.
Thank you all for joining us today. I look forward to seeing you at our future virtual shadowing sessions. Thank you again to our guest professional. We appreciate you joining us. And this marks the end of the virtual shadowing session. I invite you to disconnect from the call. Have a wonderful day. Alrighty, and we can end the recording as well. <laughs>